coming in at number 10, we have having a pale complexion. Beauty comes in every skin shade, but in the Victoria era, the paler you were, you were better and considered more beautiful. Women would often wear layers of light creams and white powders in order to look even paler, and they would already wear a red lip and try and have a dainty form. This was described as the tuberculosis look, which already sounds really concerning. And frankly, it was. A lot of different makeup they had was making women ill because of the contents in it. And apparently, the men at the time were into that. They romanticized the fever-heavy eyes, which were large and deep, and the fragile nature of a sick woman, and was compared to that of a porcelain doll. And they lost weight due to the illness. It was considered the ideal form. It makes no sense, because who would want to idealize becoming terminally ill just to attract a man? That's all different kinds of wrong. At number nine, we have beauty marks. Something else that ran rampant amongst the wealthy upper class was a bodily contracted disease that would leave giant welts and open wounds all over the body, and the face in particular. While most of these marks could be covered with clothing, they had to get a little more creative when they were on the face. So the wealthy victims would create beauty marks out of velvet or moleskin, which would be adhered to the face using different types of sticky substances, one of which being an animal fat paste used in other cosmetics. The amount of foam marks one had could also determine their social status or even mood and intentions. While beauty marks symbolize different things, Things in different cultural eras, they were simply a form of status and a clever disguise. Of course, ignoring the growing wound underneath these often led to a fashionable end, so it made sense to hide them, but didn't make sense to make it a fashion trend. At number eight, we have gladiator sweat cream. Those words really should not be used in a sentence together, because it is exactly as gross as it sounds. In ancient Rome, gladiators were a big deal, we know this, but something that became very popular was harvesting the sweat of a successful successful champion and turning into a cream or even an edible butter or paste. For the creams, the sweat would be scraped off the champion using a tool called a striggle and would be put into tiny glass vials. Women of the time would then use it as a face cream because it was supposed to help maintain youth and improve their complexions. Now, it wasn't just used by itself, but it was often mixed with olive oil. The other purpose was as an aphrodisiac, meaning they would use the runoff to hopefully get it on. They would often use a small amount to mixed with wine in order to set the mood. Neither of these makes any sense, but it is enough to make anyone cringe. At number seven, we have lead green everything. The color green is everywhere. It's in the trees, the grass, the plants, and so many other wonderful things around us. Well, in the 17th century, it was the cause of thousands of fatalities. In Sweden, 1775, a man named Carl Wilhelm Scheele created a shade of green that was mesmerizing and made with a toxic chemical called arsenite that was particularly lethal. Well, that particular shade of green was used in everything from paper to children's toys to wall painting and clothing. Green took over the fashion world and came with the cost of becoming incredibly ill. However, in the 19th century, Shields Green was replaced with Paris Green. That was also highly toxic and was used by a lot of famous painters who ended up having lifelong illnesses. For example, Monet, who went blind after being overly exposed to the paint. Now, imagine that pigment in eyeshadows or in a garment of clothing, it was equally as fatal. Thankfully for modern society, both shades of green were banned in the 1960s. At number six, we have visible veins and high hair. To add to the tuberculosis look, having bulging blue veins was apparently an attractive feature as well, but it deserved its own point because of how obscure it is. In pre-revolutionized France, while Marie Antoinette was still ruling, she and her merry band of nobles would make themselves pale, like we knew, and use a blue pencil in order to accentuate the veins to give the illusion of being even paler than she already was. The veins were on the arms, the neck, and the chest area, and any other vein that was slightly visible was made prominent. She also made big hair, well, big. The bigger the hair, the higher the status. So they would wear large wigs styled with lard in order to appear more regal, when in reality rats and mice would often make their homes in these hair pieces because they were attracted to said lard. Neither of these trends make sense, and it sounds like they were incredibly gross and inconvenient. At number five, we have the creation of cod pieces. So a cod piece is essentially a garment of interesting clothing that was used to cover a man's bits when he didn't want to wear a shirt long enough, or pants with any breathing 
clothing room. This style was on and off in popularity throughout England and Europe. In the 14th century, extremely tight leggings and short tunics became more and more popular, and men were not scared to give everyone a show. Well, as religion began to gain traction, people who followed were starting to get angry and uncomfortable with the style, seeing as it was deemed immoral. Hence, the creation of the codpiece, which became popular as well. They were made out of many different materials like velvet, cotton, and silk, and were often embroidered and bedazzled. Some of these things would also be made into armor pieces as well. While the fashion trend itself doesn't make sense, at least it made people decent. At number four, we have extremely long nails. In today's world, it's easy to have long nails. You can go to places to get fake ones, and there are different serums and growth oils to help maintain long and healthy nails. In ancient China, you were considered royal or noble if you had long and relatively healthy nails. Having long nails symbolizes not having to do any hard labor that requires working with one's hands. It also symbolized having superior body health because of the amount of nutrition required to maintain nails. Another thing that played a part in nobles having long nails was not wanting to harm or change one's physical body, because if you were if you were chosen to have a healthy body, it was meant to be protected. Because nails were considered precious, royals would often wear what was basically finger armor in order to protect them. They were also decorated in jade and other precious stones to enhance the look of finger guards. While it was a very bizarre fashion trend, it does make sense in the grand scheme of things. Anyone with long nails knows how much it hurts to break one. At number three, we have the baby look. Things we as a society are self-conscious about today were considered high beauty standards in the medieval era. For example, having a big forehead, having little to no eyebrows, or having no eyelashes. These things were deemed extremely attractive by men of that era. These practices were introduced in order to be perceived as pure as possible because lacking facial and head hair was deemed pure and youthful like cherubs and children. Because what's more pure than a child or an angel? It even got to a point where body hair in general was frowned upon which included facial hair of any sort. Eyelashes and eyebrows would be removed by plucking, but foreheads were often shaved bald rather than plucked, so at least it would be less painful and far less tedious. And while there was a comeback of tiny eyebrows in the 90s, it was nothing close to having them removed entirely. Not only does this trend make little sense, but we are so happy it was left in the past. At number two, we have the unibrow. In a complete turn of events from the last point, unibrows were extremely popular in ancient Greece. A unibrow is something a lot of people avoid in today's world because it's deemed unattractive, but in ancient Greece, it was one of the most beautiful facial features on a person, women particularly. If a woman could not grow a natural eyebrow, she would use goat hair that was dyed black and would use tree resin and sap to attach it to her face. And wealthier women was simply painted on. This was considered a beauty trend because it signified purity and intelligence, seeing as most men of the time could grow natural unibrows, which influenced the way women made themselves appear. Another common theme amongst women in ancient Greece was cutting their hair short in order to appear more masculine to attract men. It doesn't really make sense, but as long as you're happy with how you look, right? And last but not least at number one, we have having small feet, also known as foot binding. It was a beauty trend that began in the 13th century and originated in China. Feet of young girls were bound by different fabrics in order to stop them from growing properly, and they would often fold the bones of the toes inward to grow incorrectly and be permanently smaller. The ideal bride was supposed to have a foot as small as 3 inches. The average foot length in North America is 6.5, which is just over 9 inches in length. This was so that they could achieve a look called the lotus foot to fit into the lotus shoe, which was incredibly intricate and tiny. The higher the status of a woman, the smaller her feet were, which was essentially the mindset, because having large feet as a woman was considered embarrassing. Well, because of this, they would often be unable to walk and would have immense pain throughout the foot more often than not. So not only did the trend not make any sense, it was extremely painful, and it wasn't even banned until 1949. Starting our list off at number 10, the wall climber. Any fans of Spider-Man out there? I've been bouldering lately, and let me tell you, the wall climber could really help my game. The wall climber ideally would do just that let the user climb any building without the need of a pulley system. Now this gecko inspired invention may happen. It may just allow humans to climb any glass building. Finally, just the thing we need, right? All those sicknesses we're like, nah, I want a Mission Impossible some buildings. I think that's uh, more important here. Geckos can scale a wall, no problem. They're impressive, they're cute little guys. They have these plump little toes covered in microscopic bristles. Now these bristles are called setae. They allow for these licky dudes to stay on the wall all day long. Although we know the science behind them, any 
anything we try and test on it is far too heavy. Now this new wall climber device, however, it spreads the user's weight out evenly throughout the 24 tiles that make up each plate. It feels like a moving ladder, apparently. It's not too scary to use, although I would never in my life ever touch this thing terrified of heights. That would trip me out. I can't even rock climb without shaking right now, let alone scale a building with gecko gloves. No thank you. Could you do this? I don't know. I've seen Mission Impossible movies and I'm like, I could do that. I could never do that. Number nine, underwater breathing. Every time I'm watching a movie and the main character is underwater, I have to participate. I have to also hold my breath as well. You know, you're not alone, Tom Cruise. I'm also underwater with you right now. Let's do this. Let's get out of here. We've all wanted an underwater breathing apparatus at some point. We've seen it in Spy Kids or Star Wars. We grew up thinking, hoping that this was gonna happen. And maybe we're finally here. We're close, at least. Triton claimed that their artificial gills could let us breathe underwater for 45 minutes straight. The deepest you could go right now is around 15 feet, which, I mean, all things considered, not bad. This product was set to launch in 2016, but they had to refund its users, so it didn't work, but we're close. We're pretty close. Number eight, the running jetpack. Are you looking to shave exactly 20 seconds off of your mile time? Well, I have the odd thing for you. Are you also okay with wearing a jetpack the entire time you're running? Perfect. This technology was originally developed as part of DARPA's program. Now they originally wanted to make soldiers on the ground run faster, which is probably pretty intimidating with Captain America coming at you. But when that didn't plan out exactly like they hoped, they scaled back to improve performance in athletes. Now Jason Crestes, a graduate student of engineering and robotics who leads the project over at Arizona State University, they believe that this is the future of where the jetpack is going. And it looks so funny. People running this fast always looks funny. I don't know. They can now shave off 20 seconds of your mile time. Running downhill already looks so silly. I can't imagine this thing added to it. Check it out. Number seven. Portable record player. Remember when iPods came out and it was like a big deal? Of course, a thousand songs in your pocket. That's like witchcraft, right? That changed the game. I mean, even now, Spotify, it's, it's getting better and better. Portable record players back then? Eh, not so much. Not really the best invention, I don't think. Like I said, some of these suck. Eight songs in your pocket and they're all gonna scratch and get messed up. Back in the 80s, right before cassette players and Walkmans hit the street, this was the only way to listen to music on the go. So at one point in time, you had to use this and it looked so silly. That's why I had to include this. I don't think records are meant to be on your persons with headphones and like, what are you, Mozart? But a portable record player is not a good idea in any decade. In order to enjoy Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, you had to remain completely still even though you were outside, so. It wasn't really portable. It was just, you had to stay still. That would suck. How do you dance with that? You're like, ooh, I really want to move, but I can't or else I'll ruin the party. Number six, radiated toys. Yeah, don't put this one on your wish list next year. The Gilbert U238 Atomic Energy Lab Set. Here we go. It sure looks like fun, doesn't it? Upon first glance. Is that or an Xbox? What's it gonna be? Mm. But when the company released this kit back in 1950, it was all but games. Now Gilbert, the Gilbert, who was a successful toy maker at the time, even a businessman, even a magician, Magician, he believed that his line of work should be fun yet informative, right? Kind of like Bill Nye, he's fun. He'll swear every now and then, he'll mix it up, make it aggressive for no reason. He was nicknamed the man who saved Christmas right after he convinced the US Council of National Defense to not ban toy purchases during World War I around the holiday season. So, man who saved Christmas, for sure. He's like, please, please continue selling during this war. I really would like that if we kept selling things and I made money, thank you. Christmas, the Lord, giving, great. This set also wasn't cheap. It was around $50, which back in the day was more than $50 now. The price was justified as the set was actually radioactive. That's right, the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab contained a cloud chamber where you could actually see real alpha particles traveling at 12,000 miles a second. Yeah, how fun is that? You ask for a light bright, mom gives you this, you're like, guess I'm moving, guess I'm moving out. Number five, Neanderthal spears and arrows. Okay, we'll get into the more important stuff, the things that stuck around. Sure. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions of all time, one we for sure still use today. Arrows and or spears, they were a necessity when it came to hunting back then. For people in Stone Age, all they needed was wood, really. Then they'll just do the rest. So impressive. So what they would do is they would carve a leaf shape or a triangle at the tip of this wood and they were used mainly by riders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, well, you didn't want to get too close to your prey or else, you know, the wrong team would be claiming victory and eating the other for lunch. So their solution here 
was to throw these spears or make really tiny ones. Yeah, you can either javelin something really hard or hang back a bit and shoot some arrows into some animal's knees. The latter is a bit more safe. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. They're the home guard bows and they're found in Northern Europe all the way from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany about 400,000 years ago. They're actually the oldest wooden artifacts in history. Ever. Yeah, imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones or iPods. A spear? Humanity. Look at this. I made it. Number four, penicillin. Also a pretty good invention. I'll admit, this one's pretty great. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody is looking. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. But at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus bacteria that causes infections and boils. But right before Alexander left for a two-week vacation, he left a petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus on the table rather than stored away in an incubator like he should have. Now, during this time off, a penicillium mold spore just drifted in there through a window or the lab stairwell, some, some Horton, here's a who type commute, whatever, got in the room somehow, some way, and the temperature of the room and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed for the mold to settle, fight back, and prevent that bacteria from growing furthermore. He discovered when he got back this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. And now we're a little safer because of it, I'd say. Yeah, he did some good stuff. Number three, earthquake machine. Nikola Tesla, the man, he knew a thing or two about electricity and legend has it, he made a steam powered machine that could cause small earthquakes. Yeah, you thought I was gonna say machine where it could sense them. No, he made one that could cause them. A little bit of a villain move, I'd say. Science, also, I guess that's science too. Tesla's electromechanical oscillator, or earthquake machine as I call it, it's a little more cool. Legend has it he actually did cause a real earthquake back in 1898 in New York. That's an Avengers level threat right there. Can anyone stop this man? It's Nikola Tesla. Do we stop him? Do we let him go? I don't even know at this point. Tesla told this at his 79th birthday party, according to his biographer. And there's no science that supports these claims, but they're quite fun to share. Apparently he had a machine that made you, you know, uh, out of your, yeah, in your pants. There was a machine that made you, and then you, and then you had to clean up some stuff. The vibrations on this machine was basically a massive taser and it caused your muscles to clench up. So in other words, you had to change your, pants if you use this one. He's a villain. This guy's a villain now that I'm saying this out loud. Number two, Neanderthal flutes. Yes, music. Where did music come from, right? Music's been in the air for quite a long time and Neanderthals enjoyed a flute every now and then it seems. They weren't playing We Three Kings, but they were making music or some sort of sounds as early as 50,000 years ago. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second one were the flutes of Gist and Clouster Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They were made from bird bones and the ivory of a mammoth. So if that's any indication of how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. Mammoth, the thing that's extinct. And I still can't even sing, look at that. And finally, number one, Neanderthal glass. Perhaps the most impressive. This has been on my mind for a while. Imagine making glass for the first time. You would have thought that you were a wizard. I watch glass blowing shows now and I think that they're wizards. It looks like wizardry, it's, it's crazy. The guy that blows the air into it, they gotta have the spotlight on him more. He's he's doing some crazy work back there. Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. But man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists are pinning Lebanon, North Syria, ancient Egypt, all at the birthplace of synthetic glass. Now the first use of man-made glass were beads. How hilarious is that? Imagine being the first person to rock beads. Oh, the confidence. I'd put them right in front of my door and be like, don't come in. Okay, maybe. No. Mid 2000 BC, guy glazes up some beads like a wizard. What an icon. And now we have bead doors and bead necklaces. Now we have guys wearing shell necklaces too. A little different, but you know, worth a mention. They're a little odd, those ones. Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and said, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mouse trap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mouse trap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mouse trap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, 
and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mousetrap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse, after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, Dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement, with the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense, or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for women to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah. And they're cooler than me. Ugh. Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens. but. They actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. And now you are being buried alive. Have no fear friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number 4. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No sir! This is the age of machines. And if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. 
May I introduce you the Rotary Hairbrush. Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk, anyone? Number three, full of air. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. We can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic powertrains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project, as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that housed the short train the tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number two, get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but Mon thinks I play too many games. Designed by FR Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off-road terrain, instead to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number one, bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey. But back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without, the cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need to cleanse that space, bro. Number 10, steel cage match, brother. Okay, so it's the early 1900s and you're living in a rapidly growing city. Towers are popping up everywhere and that means that there's less space for you and your baby to play in. Only if there was a way my baby could get fresh air and sunshine. Meet the baby cage, yeah. A small metal cage with a tiny mattress for your baby. The said metal cage is suspended on your windowsill, making the baby spend multiple stories above ground level. This, this is just a great idea. The idea behind this terrible idea was that the babies need fresh air and sunshine. Providing them with such was thought to improve their immune system and make them healthier. Besides the fact that the only thing separating your baby from becoming the worst rainfall event of the month was a thin metal cage. This is a prime example of why every product should be thoroughly tested and thought about before selling. Eventually, these did fall out of fashion, but in reality this wasn't that long ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Number 9. Nuclear Time A lot happened in the 1900s. I mean, a lot. A couple wars here and there, the TV, the car. It was a busy century. A century full of discovery and invention. One such unusual invention was the radium dial. Watches and clocks that were painted with luminescent paint, making the numbers and dials glow in the dark. Trouble with this new invention was the paint being used wasn't exactly safe, as it was made from radium. For the Breaking Bad nerds at home, radium is a highly radioactive element, even more so than the legendary uranium. So when a factory of women eager to get to work were told they were going to be painting watches with radioactive paint, do you think anyone asked for PPE? Truth be told, not everything was known about radium as it was only recently discovered, but what's so unusual is what factories told these women how to paint the watches. In order to give the brushes a fine tip, the women were instructed to use their lips to keep the brushes in perfect order, not knowing that day after day they were ingesting a very radioactive element. 
and in some sense of dark comedy, they sometimes had fun and painted their nails and on each other. I mean, it glowed in the dark. It was glow in the dark paint. It was new. It was cool. Over 50 women would become very sick from painting, and 12 sadly lost their lives. Number eight, I'm ready for my close up. Ladies, this one's for you. In this day and age with social media, loving your self image can be tough. There's tons of things that makeup companies and media do to make you want to be the people they want you to be. If you buy said product, of course. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need all that. You're gorgeous just the way you are, and lately, honey, you've been slaying it. However, this marketing manipulation isn't new, and in the past, most certainly wasn't very subtle. Introducing the beauty micrometer, the latest from How to Horrify People Daily. It was actually invented by the famed beautician Max Factor Sr. Hell of a name. This steel KG device was placed over a poor woman's head to then mathematically calculate the flaws that would be adjusted using makeup products. Obviously, these are no longer around and for good reason. I, I, I don't even have a joke for that one. That's just weird. Number seven, back to the future. During the technological boom of electronics in the 1980s, there was one invention I think is really unusual. Computers, camcorders, and even home video game consoles were becoming commonplace all over the world. People who are familiar with retro Nintendo consoles are familiar with the likes of Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, or Contra. You may even remember a certain gaming accessory involving a laughing dog every time you miss a duck. What 80s kids might not remember is the Konami Laser Scope. Similar to Nintendo's Zapper, but with two key differences. One, it's a headset instead of a pistol. Two, it's voice controlled, meaning when you come across enemies in game, you have to shout fire to fire in game. The Konami laser scope was bold and tried to be ahead of its time, but when taking a good look at it, one, it makes the user just look ridiculous, and two, it doesn't work. Reviews for the headset are not favorable and just defeat the purpose of using a headset. Today we have VR headsets that may seem just as ridiculous, but they work, and the use of voice still isn't a primary control used in games today. Number six, Battleship Woodchip. This is one of my favorites. Okay, hear me out for this one. Back in the 1940s, there was a really super, not very fun, expensive war happening. Germany, Japan, and Italy needed to go into the timeout corner. But after a while of people trying to put each other in the timeout corner, things were getting super expensive. World War II was fought on all fronts, land, sea, and air. The sea being a key part of the war victory in the beginning of the war. Literally tons of war goods and ships were being sunk by German U-boats every day across the Atlantic. So in order to cut costs, what if the ships were built out of something cheaper, but just as tough as steel? Concrete, right? Nope, I bet you weren't thinking ice. Or more specifically, sawdust and ice mixed to form piecrete. Testing with Pycrete had gone so well that in a super secret general meeting, Pycrete was presented, shot at in the meeting, ricocheting a bullet causing another general a flesh wound. Having its defense capabilities proven in the war room, Operation Habakkuk was greenlit and the Allies were planning on constructing an aircraft carrier made out of ice and sawdust to help thwart the German U-boats. However, this was scrapped, as a boat made of sawdust and ice would really not be much help against a German U-boat. Plus. Where do you sleep? Can you cook on there? Way more questions than answers. Number five. Hello there. Channeling our inner General Grievous, our number five spot belongs to the monowheel. Originally designed in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 20th century they slapped a motor on one of these bad boys and did their best escape attempt from Utapau. Sorry, I'm a Star Wars guy. It just looks like the vehicle from the third movie. I can't help myself. In reality, the monocycle is a single wheeled motorized vehicle where the driver either sits inside the wheel housing or right beside it. Today, these vehicles are still around but really only used for entertainment purposes, as the design does have a few issues. One wheel gives balance issues, there's a visibility issue since, well, you know, you're usually sitting inside the wheel, and an issue called gerbling, which basically means if the driver brakes too hard, the inner ring will overcome its own gravity and the driver will do a full loop, similar to how a gerbil spins around on its wheel. Seeing that would make Monday morning traffic a lot more amusing though, I gotta say. Number four, deep breath my equine friend. World War I was the war to end all wars, except for the ten major wars that came after it. Noted for being the bloodiest and most destructive conflict at the time, it gave humanity a bunch of cool and exciting inventions, so long as they were not being used on you. One of the worst things to come out of the First World War was the extensive use of trench warfare and chemical weapons, or more specifically chlorine gas. 
Trench warfare was brutal, not only in its barbaric over the top charges into machine gun fire, but also in its living. Trenches had terrible living conditions and were difficult to take from the enemy. Crossing no man's land was no joke. So, to eliminate the pesky enemies entrenched in their trenches, the very cruel chlorine gas was used, causing nausea, violent coughing, chest pain, and corneal burns. Just about everything you'd find on the back of normal medication, right? Gas masks helped when they were available, but unfortunately, they were not the only living creatures on the battlefield. This is where our invention comes in the very depressing invention of the horse gas mask. The idea is the same. Horses need protection too, and since World War I was still a war powered by horses, it was more common than you might think. And a lot of our equine friends perished alongside us. Number three, Wilson! Some of you may have been cool enough back in 1975 to own a pet rock. Some of you may have not. Looking back, it doesn't really make any sense. Sure, everyone needs something to keep them company. Tom Hanks would have never gotten off the island he was stranded on if it wasn't for Wilson. Imagine a world without Tom Hanks. I, for one, would not want to live in such a world. All jokes aside, the Pet Rock was a genius marketing campaign, very similar to the fidget spinner of recent years. It's proof that if you can get a fad trade rolling, you can sell anything. Now, who wants some of my bath water? Number two, Chef's Kiss. Okay, it's 1958. Times are good. Cars have cool fins on them. Elvis is on the radio, and most of my post traumatic stress disorder has cleared up since the war was over. It's all great. Ah, yes, life is good. I can't wait to enjoy some modern cuisine. Well, let's see what's on the menu. I'll have to start with the frozen cheese salad. I'll have ham and banana hollandaise. And for dessert, I'll have the lime jello tuna pie. If that doesn't sound appetizing, I don't know what does. For some reason, halfway through the century, people just lost their taste buds. They were coming up with all kinds of disgusting foods. A lot of them are in low form for some strange reason. I think the grossest item that you can come across is a little invention called Hongar. Sounds like somebody from Skyrim, but nay good sir. Hongar is a mixture of honey and apple cider vinegar. It was thought to provide great health benefits. The only thing that would give me is a spot in front of the toilet refunding my breakfast. Ooh. Number one, Krümelauf. Germany was having a really hard time in World War II. The United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, France, and Russia too were all coming to give the mustache man a piece of their mind. Heavily outnumbered, it was time for a miracle. Time to see what top German scientists had up their sleeve. We have a rifle that can shoot around the corners. Isn't it wunderbar? Yeah, this thing is real. A curved barrel called a Krumlauf, used for shooting around tight spaces like corners and out of tank hatches. During the waning years of the war, Germany was coming up with all kinds of crazy inventions to turn the tide. But a rifle that can shoot around corners probably isn't the answer. As mentioned above, the world was coming and they needed a lot more than a fancy pants rifle to stop the allies. History tells us that this invention did not work as Mustache Man is no more. Number 10, the National Razor. What's a revolution without a little blood being spilt? Wouldn't really be a revolution, would it? France was having a hard time in the 1700s, so they needed a brand new way to get rid of pesky monarchs and anyone who isn't warming up to the revolutionary ideals. And what better way to keep people warm by cleaving their heads from their body? A man named Joseph Ignaz Guillotine suggested that there was a better method for unaliving those who needed to be unalived. A common misconception is that he invented the guillotine, but rather suggested its implementation, where his name would become synonymous with such a terrible device. Basically, you got a wood frame with a hole for your noggin and a large angled blade. Blade drops down from frame and removes the head of state from the governing body, which isn't just a clever joke, as that's what happened to the last king and queen of France. By the time of its invention and the end of its use all the way up into the 1970s, yes, that's right, it was used up until the 70s, thousands of people met their doom to the National Razor. Number nine, party favors in the sky. When you think of air travel today, you think of lots of space for you and your fellow passengers, meals that are flavorful and affordable. Air travel in 2021 is a stress-free, very organized way to travel. But in the 1700s, these luxuries of the sky were non-existent, as there was no air travel. Any international travel was done by ship, which took months at a time and was not a pleasurable experience, opposite to what was described above. Two French brothers wanted to change this, or rather just get off the ground. The two French brothers, Montegolfier, developed and flew the first unmanned hot air balloon on September 19th, 1783. This was shortly followed up with a manned flight by Jean-Francois Pilate de Rosier. This was a very strange invention at the time, as this was really the beginning of humans and flight. 
Number 8. Puckle needs his gas. Ever since black powder first made it to Europe and Europeans figured out you could make big gun that go boom, people have been trying to come up with better and faster ways to make gun go boom. In the 1700s, the biggest issue with muskets and cannons at the time was reloading or getting multiple shots off. Loading black powder weapons isn't easy. I'd say ask a pirate, but you can't. Those, those kind of pirates are all, all gone now. So to fix the issue of the day, a man named James Puckle invented the very cleverly named Puckle Gun. Basically, he just added more chambers of shot rotating around one barrel. Although his idea for the time was genius, in practice it wasn't very effective, as flintlock and black powder are really the main issue. Clumsy, lots of smoke, and does not want to work in less than fair weather conditions. Number 7. Cotton Eye Joe Dear YouTube Gods, I am sorry that history is full of not so cool things, but here at Bumblebee, I'm the queen bee, and I'm here to give the buzz to my sweet honeybees. So in the name of good morals, monetization, and not getting smited, I'm going to talk about your least favorite S word. Back in the 1700s, America was chilling. They just beat Britain in a war, which alone could be its own video. They were starting to build their own country, particularly in these southern colonies using forced unpaid labor that you can't leave. Oh, and your boss can do heinous things to you because uh, he owns you. Their economy was agricultural based and stayed that way for a long time. Tobacco being the number one crop at first, cotton was still grown but wasn't as popular due to the processing of cotton being a very labor intensive and difficult process. This was until Eli Whitney's cotton gin invented in 1794. The cotton gin was a machine that quickly removed seeds and processed cotton, making cotton a very valuable crop since, you know, the people harvesting the cotton are YouTube's least favorite S word. It's a, it's a brutal unpaid workforce. Now that it was profitable, cotton boomed and the South became very wealthy. While not exactly the main reason, the South getting rich off Whitney's design and did somewhat create a divide between the southern states and the northern states, eventually leading to the Civil War. Also, apparently plantation owners didn't pay Eli for his machine and he went broke. Just trashy behavior all around, man, come on. Number 6. Yes, I'm a Russian submarine commander. I actually couldn't believe this one myself, but the submarine was invented in the 1700s. Having designs and plans started in the 1500s, the first real use of a submersible vessel wasn't until 1775, named the Turtle, an acorn-shaped vessel with a crew of just one. To me, it's just hard to think that in the same century we were beginning to master flight and sea travel. I also can't stop thinking that if there was a water ride that existed, it would be pretty cool if you went underwater in like a pod, like a submarine kind of thing. Just an idea for the mouse and the corporation. Of course, it wouldn't be years until after the turtle that the submarine would see effective use. Or have a Scottish man play a Russian submarine commander in a really good movie. Russian submarine commander. Number 5. Dawn of the Punch Guard With the Industrial Revolution on the horizon, many things were about to change. Probably the most obvious at the time was factories. While not the first, Richard Arkwright's Cromford Mill in 1771 is what most resembles a modern factory today. Cromford Mill was the first water-powered cotton spinning mill and initially employed 200 workers. It ran day and night with two 12-hour work shifts, the gates being locked at 6am and 6pm, permitting no late arrivals. Oh, he likes to keep a tight schedule. Yeah, I can see the beginnings of a modern factory, all right. All you're missing is Bezos and a couple of drones to make it modern. All jokes aside, though, uh, these early factories changed the very fabric of not only Britain, but also the world. I mean, where would we be today with all that lovely pollution and those great and fair working conditions? I, I, I bet there was benefits, too. Number 4. The Golden Liquid You drink liquid, and then it's gonna come out of you. It's simple. It's science. But sometimes other fluids need to be drained. Sometimes you can have difficulty using the little boys room. Personally, I'm still learning how to put down the toilet seat. I haven't quite figured that one out. How to make pee when a person cannot pee. Portly founding father Benjamin Franklin thought to himself as he was holding a kite in the rain. This is something I learned, which I didn't know, is that he invented the flexible catheter. Yep. Next time you feel a little weird because a tube is being inserted into a sensitive area, you can thank the man on the $100 bill. Invented in 1752 in order to aid his brother with bladder stones. It's strange though, you know, you think of a guy inventing other things, but in reality, it's a really important invention and something that's very common in the medical world today. I just hope to stay healthy long enough so no tube has to go near my founding father. Number 3. Pseudo Cool Okay, so back in the 1700s, food was really hard to keep. For example, meat is packed with a salty brine in order to preserve it. It either has to be shipped overseas or last long enough through a cold and brutal winter. But plans for refrigeration were being drawn up, specifically the idea of vapor compression refrigeration. Not exactly the fridge that's in your kitchen today, considering there's 
you know, still no main harnessing of electricity, which makes fridges run, but a brilliant idea nonetheless. While the fridge we know was still far away, it's crazy to think in the 1700s we had serious plans for one. While this was being developed, food was kept near lakes and snows in the winter. Runoffs from mountains were often used to keep drinks cool. I think this is something we all take for granted. I mean, can you imagine drinking room temperature milk or having a beef dinner that tastes saltier than salt? Looking back through history, it's interesting to see how humans persevere. As much as I love food, I don't know if I could stomach food from the past. Thank goodness we don't eat anything gross today. Hey man, uh, do you have any canned cheese left? I'm kind of hungry. Number two, ebony, ivory, living together in harmony. I honestly thought this one was older than the 1700s, but hey, here we are, invented in the year 1700 by a musically inclined Italian gentleman named Bartolomeo Cristofori. Unhappy with what was going on at the time, he decided to spice it up by changing out a few parts of some common instruments and started using little hammers that strike quickly on chords and come back in hopes they would not dampen the sound. A little fine tuning here and there and bada bing bada boom, you got a piano. I would attempt to make a joke about the piano, but let's be honest, no piano, no Elton John. No jazz, no Frank Sinatra. If you're asking me, that's a big problem. Number one, ABCs. As someone who struggles with reading, this one makes me want to hide under my covers at night. I spent countless hours as a kid learning to read and oh, Man, the phonics lessons were brutal. And thanks to this invention, I can blame it all on the 1755 invention, the English Dictionary. Yep, that's right. One of the most influential too. Written by Samuel Johnson, it took seven years to compile all the words I can't pronounce. He was commissioned 1,500 guineas for the project, which is worth about 250,000 pounds today. Until the completion of the Oxford Dictionary 173 years later, Johnson's Dictionary is considered to be the preeminent English dictionary and a huge achievement in scholarship. I mean, you gotta give the guy credit for writing this. Imagine writing an English essay for seven years. But then again, 250,000 pounds for some of my writing also sounds pretty good. All I have to do now is learn to read and write. Number 10, Game Boy Shoes. I'm not the most fashionable guy on the planet. I'm just a simple guy who likes simple things. So you can understand my shock, my horror, and my confusion when I saw the Game Boy shoes. Yes, that's right. Remember the Game Boy? Picking a starter Pokemon for the first time. That was a really serious choice. The very same portable console that changed your childhood could now sit snug as a bug in your platform shoe. I have several issues with this. One, can someone send me a working Game Boy? I miss those games, man. Come on, those are, those are really cool, I want one. Number two, it just looks ugly. No shot, you roll up to somebody's house with those bad boys and they go, yeah, you're cool, dude, you look great. You don't. Number three, maybe this is fine to wear in sunny California, but in Canada, the Game Boy would spend most of its time in snow or puddles. I couldn't do that to such a beautiful piece of gaming history. I would never forgive myself. Number nine, are you winning, son? Is something your dad and every dad has said when checking on their kid playing games on a Sunday afternoon. Naturally, not knowing what a video game is or what a Pikachu does is just part of being a dad. However, next time dad decides to go on one of his fishing trips, you should surprise him with the Game Boy Fish Finder. Yeah, I know, another Game Boy gadget, but I had to. Every dad says they caught the big one, and they're not talking about your mom, but now dad can see them coming. Imagine spending hours in the summer sun on a lake with your dad, and the only thing that was distracting you from his developing drinking issue is now being used to find fish. Sometimes Nintendo likes to do weird stuff. Remember when the Wii came out? It was just it was kind of weird. Loved it though. But a fish finder? This is only something a 90s fever dream could come up with. I, I'm just not sure about that one. Number eight, floppy disks. Going with a lot of tech today, but stuff like this defined the later half of the century. Why are floppy disks on this list? Well, because it was arguably just as important as the PCs that revolutionized computers. And it's silly to think that how storage that small was so useful. Storage on floppy disks varied from different models over the years, but for an example, one model held 1.44 megabytes. Today in 2022, we are arguably in the beginning of the terabyte era. Now, try putting more than five AAA games on your Xbox, am I right? Gigabytes just aren't enough anymore. Now, if you crunch some numbers, a one terabyte flash drive has over one million MG, which, if we do even more math, is just under 700,000 floppy disks to our modern equivalent. The math is a little rough, but my point is clear. We've come a long way. Well, it turns out that they were still somewhat being used up until 2019. 
That's I know, that's what I said. The US and whatever mysterious forces are in charge of nuclear weapons, we're still using them up until 2019. I feel like that's the wrong thing to put in charge of nuclear weapons. A floppy disk for nukes, that just feels like a bad idea. Number seven, dial P for Palpatine. <laughs> I just wanted to give you guys some more Palpatine. I think you guys really like it. But something that I don't know if our viewers experience, but let us know if you did. This is kind of interesting actually, but the creation of 911. Honestly, what did people do before that? Pick up the phone and like, operator, help, help, my house is on fire. Okay, sir, hold on, we'll just connect to you. Uh, okay, thanks. This is the fire department. Help, help, my house is on fire. Well, thanks to the totally non-corrupt and fairly priced AT&T, a nationwide number was decided to be the best for dialing emergencies and not waiting for an operator or any other option like screaming for help. A senator made the first 911 call on February 16th, 1968, which sounds like a long time ago and it is, but it also kinda isn't. I don't know, that's kinda weird. Number six, I am the destroyer of worlds. I mean, this is kind of a big one, literally. It's the reason why there hasn't been a World War III since, or why there will never be a World War IV, because there would just be nothing left. What am I talking about, of course? Jello mold foods. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about nuclear weapons with the capabilities to wipe out an entire city with the flip of a button. Part of the super secret Manhattan project, the goal was to make a weapon so destructive that whoever was unfortunate enough to catch a case of the super weapon would surrender immediately. Japan would unfortunately be on the receiving side of this, and shortly thereafter surrendered World War II. Imagine though, the power to level an entire city in just a few seconds. It's something unthinkable just a few years before. Some might even call it an act of biblical proportions. And you wouldn't be that far off either. Number five, only us humans. Human beings, smart, intelligent, loving creatures, right? Well, the ones I like to be around are, and I hope the ones around you are too. Okay, where am I going with this? Well, I think we can all agree that war sucks, right? Look at Ukraine and Russia right now. What I think a lot of people don't think about is war logistics, what goes into a war effort. Every bootstrap, backpack, and bullet fired has to be counted and shipped. The weirdest thing, or perhaps the worst thing that we've done is mass produce small arms. The Avdamat Kalashnikov needs no introduction. You've seen it in movies, games, and all over the news in the last 60 years. An effective, cheap, and reliable tool that's the backbone of insurrections across the world and probably will be for many years to come. The point I'm trying to make is that we can create and make such beautiful things, but so much time has gone into destroying one another. Kalashnikov is unfortunately really good at doing that. In some black markets of the third world countries, they go for as little as $100 US. It is estimated that of every firearm ever made, one in five is a Kalashnikov. Number four, I wanted one. It should come as no surprise that my persona is that of a lumberjack. I like relaxing after a long day. I'm big and I like beer. That's how it goes. While certainly not the manliest man, you'd never find me at a My Little Pony convention. I'm just not going there. Where am I going with this? Well, if you were a young girl growing up, there's a chance you had an easy bake oven. Yes, that's right. I, Big Jed, wanted an easy bake oven. But as a young man, I was embarrassed to have pink. I mean, come on, I can't have pink. It's, it's pink. Even though now I'd be totally fine with pink. I, like, I, I, like, I like pink cars, I think they look cool. I was a tubby kid and just wanted some brownies with icing. Can you blame me? No, you can't. However, there is something about giving your kid a little oven that's, well, strange. There's no way I should have been given anything sharp, let alone an oven. Yes, I know they're pretty safe, but still, it's a weird concept. And weird thing to bring up in the boardroom for an idea. Guy walks in the room and he's like, kids, ovens. Fires, put them together, what do you got? Million dollar idea, let's go. Number three, didn't sell very well, boy. I doubt many people would remember this, and in Nintendo's defense, they usually know what they're doing, sometimes. I know I'm talking about gaming stuff again, but besides making you guys laugh, it's like the only other passion I have, man. The Virtual Boy, I wouldn't expect many to have seen it since the sales were so poor, since the console was so poor. The Virtual Boy was a 32-bit portable console that was basically a headset, except, you know, there's no straps to put it on your head, but a stand so you can play games while you sit or while you're prone? I guess that would have been cool if there was like a sniper game or something, but for classic Nintendo side-scrolling action, it doesn't really make any sense. The main selling point was the graphics. The Virtual Boy was capable of 3D, which was huge for the time. Except, it was stereographic 3D and monochrome red. Watching footage of the gameplay gives me a headache just looking at it, so I can see why laying down on your living room floor for a while, playing it, would just suck. 
it just wouldn't be good. Number two, Electronic Cafe. This is going to sound weird to anyone born after 1995, but there used to be internet cafes. Yeah, I know, there's some that still exist, but it's just a weird concept. Hi, come on in where you can order a coffee and browse the World Wide Web with your sticky keys. And that's not because of a typo. There's just something about sharing a PC with the whole city that rubs me the wrong way. Because I know for a fact there's some dudes in there who are rubbing themselves the wrong way in the cafe. In the 90s when PCs were becoming a mainstay in homes and offices, some folks just didn't have one yet. Or if they did, had full access to the internet. Do you remember the dial-up sound? Ooh, sound of nightmares. So coming to a place to access such modern technology made sense in the 1990s and even the early 2000s. However, in 2022, when everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket, not so much. Smartphones are really cool. It's, it's actually pretty cool technology. Number one, the infomercial king. Not the first to do it and won't be the last, but he may be the best. As a kid growing up in the late 90s, watching TV on a Sunday afternoon made a few things certain. I was going to have my snackies and juice. I was going to ponder what a house hippo was. I was going to be yelled at by a man with enough charisma to use OxyClean. Yes, the famous infomercial featuring the late Billy Mays. There was just something charming about his performance that made you want to clean stains easily. Infomercials are a way to shove products down your throat. Call now, but wait, there's more. Three easy payments of $19.99. Sell, sell, sell. With infomercials, they aren't just selling you a product. They are selling the infomercial themselves. It just wouldn't be as effective if the ShamWow guy wasn't weird about his peanuts on ice cream. That's just how it goes. Number 10, extinction. Neanderthal history dates back to around 430,000 years ago. We've always thought that their extinction was caused by some sort of event, some catastrophic wipeout of some sorts, you name it. And we're trying to pinpoint it every day. Not every day, but you get it. There's a new Netflix documentary called Ancient Apocalypse where Graham Hancock explains this very event. What wiped out early humans? And rather, what's left of them? Very recently, a human tooth was discovered in a cave in southern France. Now, this tooth in question is from 54,000 years ago. Now, up until this point, we always thought Neanderthals went extinct around 40,000 years ago when modern humans started to roll in. But this new discovery could mean that the two species may have coexisted at the same time. Imagine that, you're going to work, you see a Neanderthal, you're like, hey, what's up? This is an odd 10,000 years, cool. Did modern humans wipe out Neanderthals? Maybe, I mean, probably. Are Homo sapiens to blame for the extinction of Neanderthals? That would be crazy, imagine that. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, hey, hit that thumbs up button, cheers. Species are wiping out each other, this is crazy. Number nine, craftsmen. It doesn't matter how far back you go, art will always be around in some way, shape, or form. Literally, Neanderthal craftsmen would carry with them a pouch and it would basically be a vandalism pouch. They could just go around and draw anything they wanted. And inside of it, it includes lithic flakes, sharp rock flakes basically to cut anything at any time. You had with them scrapers as well, which would be used to cut animal meat or carve wood. Pressure tools were also in there as well to sharpen said other tools. Just the first ever tool belt, essentially. Now, Neanderthals would use hard rock napping and use striking techniques, and sometimes they would carve art. Neanderthal carvings were discovered in Unicorn Cave over in Germany recently. Archaeologists found 50,000-year-old deer bone with patterns carved into it with said tools. So either these guys were bored or they were expressing themselves via art. Number eight. Food supply. Hunting looks challenging today, let alone thousands of years ago. I'm sure a crossbow helps, but back then, not so easy. Neanderthals would of course have to hunt in order to eat and survive, but just what did they eat? Hardened tartar hinted at their diet, and that diet being mussels, dolphin, seal, and tons of plants. Now this came to light after part of a seal's jaw was discovered in a vanguard cave in Gibraltar. Now the jaw in question had man-made cut marks, marks from tools that I mentioned earlier. So now we have a full picture. Now we can put a date on it. Number seven, the Pit of Bones. Ah, the Pit of Bones, classic, great name. Located in Northern Spain. Yeah, first of all, what a horrible, scary name that is. Imagine pitching this to the wife for a family trip. Yeah, we're going to the Pit of Bones. Grab your sandals, it's gonna be great. Since 1976, well over 6,000 human fossils have been collected from the Pit of Bones. They found around 28 individual Neanderthals in total. So maybe the Pit of Bones is actually a great name after all. 
kind of nails it, I guess. The skeletons date back to around 430,000 years ago. Now, in terms of facial features, these are for sure Neanderthals. We can confirm them. Neanderthal lineage confirmed. Very old. That's so old. I can't even imagine. Number six, spears and arrows. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions, and one that we for sure still use today, is that of arrows and spears. They were a necessity, of course, back then when it came to hunting, and for people in the Stone Age, well, all they needed was wood, really. They would carve a leaf shape or a triangle at the tip, our modern day arrow, and they were used mainly by raiders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, you didn't want to get too close to your prey, right? Or else the wrong team would be claiming victory and then eating the other for lunch. So their solution was to throw these spears or make really tiny ones. One of two. You can either javelin somebody really hard or hang back and you know just shoot a big dude with an arrow. One of the two. It's gonna be a lose-lose probably. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. Can you believe that? And they're home guard bows. And they're found in Northern Europe all the way from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany around 400,000 years ago. They're actually the oldest wooden artifacts in history. Imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones, a spear? Buddy, you're a genius. Number five, medicine. You can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have, right? Hunting down a mammoth or a bison three times the size of you, yeah, odds are you're gonna get a bruise or two. More than fair. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? Is that what the pile of bones is for? I'm starting to connect this, that makes more sense. God, that's dark. How did Neanderthals live for so long without a pharmacy, right? All that yelling, no halls. Are you kidding? My throat hurts doing this list already. Neanderthal medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, that's it, right? It changes your life. They manage fevers, but when the pain got too bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped tolerate all that pain. Yeah, 4,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were chewing on aspirin. Number four, forbidden friends. Lascaux cave paintings date back to some 17,000 years ago, and a lot of the art seen on the walls of the cave art that depicts animals. It's mostly pretty much all animals, it's beautiful. About 900 of them, with just over 600 being recently identifiable. There are cattle, bison, some wild cats, bears, birds, you name it, but there are no reindeer at all. What happened, right? Did they just forget about this one specific animal out of 900, although they ate reindeer meat almost every day? Well, it took a long time to realize, but our best guess as to why they were missing from all these works of art is because these animals are ones that they never caught. Yeah, these are animals that they would dream about, right? They were always afar, just running away. They could never hunt or catch them because at this time they were too fast or too strong. Plus, at this time, they didn't have certain weapons or tools available yet. More than fair, I would much rather draw a bison than have to tackle one, you know what I mean? Number three, more art. Okay, here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have an actual representational version of their art, but we do have symbolism, which is, some would argue the same thing, that's pretty close. And just as fascinating, really. Especially when they look like this, when they look like a masterpiece in a cave. These are eagle talons. They're about 130,000 years old and they're found at the Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. And researchers believe that they were part of a jewelry set, like earrings or a part of a necklace, something like that. I couldn't even make this now with a YouTube tutorial, let alone 130,000 years ago. This is mind blowing. Number two, flutes. Music has been in the air for quite a long time now, and Neanderthals enjoyed a flute every now and then, it seems. Yeah, they weren't playing We Three Kings or anything like that, but they were making music as early as 50,000 years ago. Incredible, I still can't even whistle 50,000 years later. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of guys in Cluster Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They're made from bird bone and ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, so if it's any indication how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. Yeah, take that, Skrillex. Finally, number one, glass. Imagine making glass. Imagine being like, oh yeah, my dad makes glass. I don't know, he's a magician, I guess. Imagine making glass for the first time. You know what I mean? Like, you're a wizard. Even if you made glass now, I would think you're a wizard. Glass blowing shows on Netflix. I'm like, you're all wizards. How do you do this? Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian, for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. Man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists are pitting Lebanon, North Syria, ancient Egypt, all as the birthplace of synthetic glass. The first use of man-made glass were beads. Yeah, imagine being the first person to rock beads. Ah, oh, the confidence. A bead door? An ancient bead door? You would be a genius. Mid-2000s BC, a guy glazes up some beads. What an icon. Like I said, art comes in many different shapes and sizes. Number 10, 
tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Brit in me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number nine, Compass. A vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade 4 museum field trip, tisk tisk, it will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the west. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number eight, movable type printing. Fun fact, the first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers. Innovation, am I right? Number seven, gunpowder. Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron, or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistol. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmoam Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number six, deep drilling. The province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the 2nd century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that. We're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep, which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number five, silk. 
I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're going to be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the Shark Tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road, or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much that they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices, but it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. It comes from Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. We know this from a less ancient book called the Neijing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, that would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long-winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, earthquake detector. Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprises me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life. And if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. Some of you are probably not gonna know what a waterbed is, but that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from. Something that goes hand in hand with the compass from earlier. Oh, interesting. Number two, beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no, first beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. Two of my favorite beverages. That's it, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only, this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This 4 or 5% alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs. And three and a half to 4,000 years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet. But with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the JLZ money is that it wasn't backed by anything. So it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much, inflation. Starting with the K car. Oh yeah, these babies saved early 80s Chryslers from financial decimation. Remembered fondly for being front drive, inexpensive to produce, and absolutely plebeian, this efficient series was versatile and it had many variants. It was designed to be an economy car 
car with limited engine choices, primarily a dinky four-cylinder engine claiming between 30 and 40 miles per gallon. The K-Car was the basis for multiple Chrysler vehicles once the launch of the Reliant and Aries standard entry-level vehicles pulled them out of the financial ground a little bit. There were the Dodge Aries, the Plymouth Reliant, the Dodge 400, and the Chrysler LeBaron. By the mid-1980s, however, the decision proved itself successful with over 50% of Chrysler's profit coming directly from the K-Car brands. Naturally, you could give it the classic 80s do-up. The snazzy wooden belt around the outside, the CB radio, the Landau roof, and even velour bench seats with button tufting. Ah, the 80s. As disrespected as it was versatile, the lowly K-Car spread its plebeian roots and survived until 1995. For those of us who didn't see it in person, you most definitely have in movies and TV such as The Breakfast Club's Red Dodge Aries and the cool Chrysler LeBaron convertible in St. Elmo's Fire. Turn your lawn into a Trojan battlefield by playing Lawn Darts, a game where you punt a four inch metal spike with a handle across your lawn and ideally not into your neighbor, childhood. Alright, so this nightmare product didn't origin in the 80s, hell it wasn't even from the 70s. Lawn Darts go as far back as 500 BCE Greece and are obviously inspired by the battle and hunting weapon a spear, which is known to be given a charging or spinning start before being thrown. They were banned in 1970 initially by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, but the manufacturers challenged the ban and a compromise was reached wherein a lawn dart could no longer be marketed or sold as toys or in toy stores and had to contain the following warning. Not a toy for use by children, may cause serious or fatal injury, read instructions carefully, keep out of reach of children. But it's the 80s when children could do and did do whatever they wanted with reckless abandon without any supervision. Naturally, this was the time lawn darts became a booming trend once more and fell into the hands of the irresponsible. There are three known deaths relating to lawn darts. The father of one victim made it his mission to get the game re-banned. His campaign had the Consumer Commission reevaluate the injuries and deaths lawn darts had caused and oopsie, they had misidentified how many injuries there were that had to be updated in statistics. Turns out from January of 1978 to December of 1986, lawn darts were responsible for an estimated hmm, 6,100 hospital emergency room treated injuries and approximately 81% of the victims were under 15 years old. So yeah, in 1988 the commission voted to ban lawn darts sale completely. Now that we're done spearing the neighbors, let's play some video games on the ColecoVision. The 80s saw the advent of so many video games that we love now. Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Super Mario Bros, Tetris to name a few. So after nearly bankrupting itself in 1978 with the overstocked and failed Telstar units, Coleco once again entered the console market looking to dethrone the Atari 2600 and the Intellivision, the current kings of the video game hill. The ColecoVision was released in 1982. It boasted amazing specs for the time which showed in its arcade conversions. They did two things to secure their success. First, the Atari 2600 contained no patented material and was made up all of off-the-shelf hardware. So ColecoVision's expansion module 1 was essentially an entire 2600 which could fit into the Coleco's expansion port, aka they stole the 2600's games without stealing them. This gave gamers access to Atari's large library of games on a newer, better device and field interest to swap over to the console. Secondly, Coleco reached out to Japanese-based company called Nintendo, paying $250,000 for the rights of super popular arcade game called Donkey Kong, which would become the pack-in game with the console. Between its release of August 1982 and the Christmas that year, ColecoVision sold more than 500,000 units. The console actually only went out of use when the manufacturer just shifted focus to computer games. How about we do some arts and crafts? We can use puffy paint. Back in the times where custom clothing wasn't as easily orderable online, puffy paint was amongst the hottest ways to adorn your garb with personality, alongside fabric markers and bedazzlers and airbrush and tie-dye, of course. But puffy paint took it up a notch. Unlike 2D markers and overdone rhinestones, this paint went on wet and as it dried, it lifted to become quite literally puffy. Different levels of puffy could be achieved with different paints. Really sucked when you wanted a giant pink flower to be puffy, but giant puff didn't come in pink colors. It was even better if it was glow in the dark, since visiting a roller rink without some kind of glow fashion was practically a crime. Now you can match your favorite roller skates during disco hour. Yeah, puffy paint truly turned your favorite shirt into a three-dimensional work of art, and it only started cracking and peeling off after the second wash. Amazing. A sleepover favorite was the horror hotline fad. Hotlines were a big thing in general during this time. Even kids' channels were advertising calling in to talk to your favorite cartoon character for a credit card fee that would have your parents ready to toss you out of the house. Horror hotlines 
phones in particular though, those were huge. They were generally 900 numbers, a premium high rate telephone number that is charged by the minute. These lines didn't become profitable for the average person to run until 1987 when AT&T launched a national call program allowing people to make money privately off of 900 numbers. Prices were often set up at $2 for the first minute and then smaller but still substantial sums for each minute afterwards. For horror stories, this is perfect. You could keep your listener on the line, building anticipation and fear in a story that keeps them hooked, willing to pay another few cents just to hear the end. Some examples of these numbers were 1900909 dare based off of the 976 evil horror movie that is literally about being possessed through a horror hotline, 1900490 dead which was a zombie hotline, 1900660 fred was used to listen to the terrifying dialogues of Freddy Krueger. I could go on, there's truly hundreds of these. 900 numbers tapered off due to the increased regulation in the mid 90s. This is because even though these numbers very obviously aimed at children did instruct anyone under 18 to ask parents for permission before calling, most did not. This resulted in some exorbitant phone bills and angry parents. The FTC made it illegal in 1993 to advertise 900 numbers to children under the age of 12 unless it was educational. Thankfully, adults are still able to use them for their version of entertainment if you catch my drift. Another kid aimed item was Freezy Freakies, which sounds way more inappropriate than it actually is. These are actually the item on the list that if it were to come out again exactly as it had been in the 80s, it would still sell nowadays. Kids who grew up in the northeast were pretty invested in this fad that might have gone unnoticed in warmer areas. It's a thick winter glove that when the temperature dipped below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, an image would suddenly appear on the material on the top of your hand. 30 plus designs were released, the most popular being a robot, a unicorn, rocket ships, ballerinas, rainbows, snowflakes, and various sports themes. Though the I love snow with a heart were the most popular amongst all ages. The secret to the $13 freakies was thermochronic ink, a temperature sensitive dye that's been used in mood rings and heat sensitive food labels and can appear translucent until it's exposed to warmer temperatures. At the height of freezy mania, the manufacturer was moving 300,000 pairs of gloves per year. And while freezy freakies lasted well over a decade, by the 1990s things had cooled. Color changing ink for coffee mugs or beer cans was more common, wearing down the novelty, and knockoffs had also grabbed licensed cartoon characters, which the freezies were never interested in pursuing. Regardless, they're still available for purchase today. Taking it from the back 40s to the small screen, it's a duck hunt, quite literally. Like said, there was a lot of video games coming out in the 80s, but duck hunt was unique. This game is what popularized light gun video games, games where you can use a real prop to interact with the screen. At the time of its release in 84, duck hunt was pretty much the first of its kind. The game was released for and by Nintendo, first as an arcade game, but then a launch game for the NES system in North America in 85. You would use the CRT television for my youngins, that's the big curved one that takes up like four cubic feet and has a green haze over the screen your parents could use to suss out if you're lying about watching TV before they came in the room, and the NES zapper to shoot ducks appearing on said screen. They'd appear one or two at a time and you'd only have three missed shots before you're out. You hit the right amount of ducks, you're on to the next level. I played this not too long ago on an old CRT myself and nothing says entertainment like being two feet from a screen and getting made fun of by your best friend for getting game rage at an 84 video game. Beginning with the nationwide rollout of NES in 1986, Duck Hunt was one of several titles Nintendo included in a pack-in game with some of its releases. It remains the most sold out shooting game in the world. One fun tidbit I'll leave you with is the legacy of the Duck Hunt dog. It's only known by this name and would accompany players in certain game modes, notorious for laughing at you whenever you miss. The dog went on to cameo in another NES game, Bill Barker's Trick Shooting, but he also cameos in 2006 We Play and in 2011 We Play Motion. In 2014 Super Smash Bros, the dog and one of the ducks appear collectively as playable characters, and the Duck Hunt team and stage reappear in the 2019 Super Smash Bros Ultimate. In 2015 film Pixels, it's the dog's best appearance, a cameo where it's given a trophy by the aliens and adopted by an old woman. The most memorable name on the list has to be Blockbuster. I can smell old carpets riddled with soda and mildew now. Nothing says luxury like wandering here on a Friday night to rent a copy of the newly released River's Edge and crush on a young Keanu Reeves with your bestie. In 1985, the first Blockbuster opened in Dallas, Texas. Yeehaw! At the time, most video rental stores were private ownership and offered a limited selection of titles. Seeing as Blockbuster had some 8,000 tapes displayed and readily available in a computerized checkout process, well, the first store was an unsurprising success and they expanded rapidly. They eventually became the largest providers of in-home movie entertainment and expanded to video and board game rentals as well. By 1985, Blockbuster was America's leading video chain with some 400 stores. By the early 
1990s, Blockbuster launched its 1,000th store and expanded into the overseas market. While in the 80s they reigned, the 90s they fall. In the mid-1990s, the DVD made its debut, and with it came Netflix, the online DVD rental company, and Amazon Video Stores. Pay-per-view was an additional stab to Blockbuster's gut. The additional competition of being able to watch instantly without leaving home was just way too much. In 2004, Blockbuster tried to keep up with the online DVD rental service, but it just couldn't compete with Netflix's. On September 23rd of 2010, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. By 2014, the last of the company-owned stores had closed. And that, kids, is how streaming killed the video star. No more monkeys jumping on the bed, especially when mom installs the waterbed. Oh yeah, these little baddies dominated the sleeping world for quite a while. And sure, they weren't invented in the 80s, rather the late 60s, but these beds were all the wave in the 80s. Get it? Seriously though, the 80s were the height of waterbed fame. It was as if they hadn't existed prior. After experimenting with chairs filled with cornstarch and even jello, Charlie Hall, a design student at San Francisco State University, hit upon the idea of a mattress full of water. Their advent suited the swinging 60s lustrous mindset. One company claimed that two things are better on a waterbed and one of them is sleep. And Charlie Hall did sell waterbeds to Hugh Hefner to cover in Tasmanian possum hair after all. By 1971, Time Magazine reported that in Manhattan, the waterbed display at Bloomingdale's department store for a while was the popular singles meeting place. But we're talking 80s, when the waterbed had successfully made the leap from lonely, luxurious bachelors to the suburban bedroom. At the peak of the waterbed craze in 1987, more than one out of five mattresses purchased in the US were waterbeds, meaning that they were more mainstream than a regular mattress. So why did mainstream vanish the way it did? Couple reasons. That sexual association, great marketing during the 1970s and early 1980s, became albatross by the 1990s. It also had technological shortcomings. They had very heavy wooden frames, required a hose to fill and empty. Moving them was disastrous, and I mean algae or leaks are a concern. Even nowadays, mattress retailers have expressed a client can lay on a mattress and love it, but learning it's a waterbed makes it an immediate no never mind. Mainly the reason's simple. Waterbeds emerged during a time where the culture embraced anything different, especially a product that embodied sexual liberation or creative freedom. We aren't the same anymore. Before Pokemon, garbage pail kids were what got you sent home from school for not paying attention. Man, did parents and teachers hate them, but that is part of what made kids love them more. Everything about these cards was about irony and puns, from the name to the art to the literal mocking origins. Garbage Pail Kids came out in 1985 as trading cards depicting a character having some comical abnormality, deformity, or terrible injury or disease, all with a humorous wordplay character name such as Atom Bomb or Blasted Billy. Many of the cards backs feature puzzle pieces that form a giant mural, while others vary depending on various series, from humorous licenses and awards to comic strips. The cards were actually made to parody the Cabbage Patch Kids doll franchise that was booming at the time as a boys product alternative. And it worked! Garbage Pail Kids quickly became the coolest thing around, with over 800 million cards making in the hands of children everywhere. The cards even inspired a live action movie and an animated TV show, both made in 1987. The movie was so bad, it grossed out critics and earned several Razzie Awards, which is a satirical awards show for cinematic failures. Cabbage Batch Kids got the last laugh, however, after suing, the producers of Garbage Pail Kids settled outside a court to remove the resemblance between the characters and to change the logo design. Production of the cards themselves continued, but by 1988, the sales had dwindled and a, seri and a planned Series 16 was just never produced. These cards were banned, traded, and now collected. Some of these vintages are worth fortunes nowadays. Such as number 10, Basilica Cannon. So I really have been out here thinking all the types of cannons were just like big and small. I didn't really know they had actual names, but the Ottoman Empire's military technology was obscenely advanced, featuring firearms, gunpowder, and now cannons, thanks to their inventor, Orban, and the Emperor Constantine of the Byzantine Empire. See, Orban offered to sell his ingenious invention to this emperor, but Constantine couldn't afford the price. His attempts to bargain just dissuaded Orban from selling it to him even more. So Orban sold the cannon to the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed the Conqueror, who was practically salivating at the mouth when he learned that this device could smash through walls with a giant projectile. After purchasing these cannons and their three month build time, he used them to defeat Constantinople in 1453, taking only 53 days to take over the city and the Sultan's status. The cannonball, which could be shot at a distance of one mile, weighed 1,200 pounds. Due to its size, it was dragged by 60 oxen and 400 men. Additionally, due to the material the cannon was constructed of, the intense heat created by the charge after each shot made the barrel have to be soaked in warm oil to prevent cold air from penetrating 
cleaning and enlarging the fissures, and it prevented it from being fired more than three times a day. Ultimately, it only lasted six weeks before it became non-functional, and the loading and transport of the cannon killed some of its operators. For a first-time invention, I'd say that's at least still a pretty good track record. Number nine is a water pump, a six-cylinder monoblock water pump to be exact. Now, this is an insane and impressive invention. Created in 1550, it was innovative and made to run off of the water it pumped. So, piston rods, lead weights, and then of course the delivery pipes all worked as part of a system of an oscillating water recycling and pumping device. The use of water wheel technology was widely spread in the Middle East before and after Islam. It's from this long-lasting heritage that Muslim engineers adopted and improved this technology and applied it everywhere. In the city of Murcia, for example, during the Islamic rule of Spain, a water wheel was established still known today under the name La Aurora. Although the original wheel has been replaced by a new one in steel, the original system that was built for it is otherwise unchanged. Muslim engineers used two solutions to achieve maximum output from a water mill. The first solution was to mount them to piers of the bridges to take advantage of the increased flow. The second solution was the ship mill, a type of water mill powered by water wheels mounted on the sides of ships moored in the midstream. It seems according to historians of technology that the earliest descriptions of this kind of machine in the west goes back to Cardin in 1550 and Ramali in 1588, meaning that Taqi was amongst the first to describe this water machine as he finished his manuscript in 1551-52 and that made him the first to produce the actual machine when he built it. Furthermore, it proved a remarkable invention as it helped with the water supply to the city's empire. Number 8 is the invention of mechanical clocks. So as you may know from our past Ottoman video, the Ottomans were incredibly advanced in astrological and celestial body understanding. That's how they achieved observatories and also astronomical clocks that indicated the positions of the bodies like sun, moon, and other planets. Taqiq al deens yes the guy who did the water pump from the last segment, created a clock that could set off an alarm at a specific time. And while the alarm clock wasn't necessarily new, users could actually set Taqiq's clocks to go off at a specific time because of the peg he placed close to the dial wheel. When the dial was set to a specific time, the peg would set off the ringer when the clock arm touched the time. This was also the first clock capable of indicating hours, minutes, and seconds, aka he essentially invented time of day. This was obviously a significant breakthrough. All clocks existing before were inaccurate or still sundial based and couldn't be relied on for correct astronomical data. But Taqi's invention meant that the world can now record accurate astronomical information. Logos are number seven. That's right, they've had a long journey to what they are now with glowing neon signs, the branding on our jeans, the image on your favorite soda can. All of it is traced back to the Ottomans and their invention of Tugra, an imperial trademark where writing takes picture form to denote a branding. How this started, according to legend, was an illiterate sultan who had followed the sacred practice of the sultan's silence, but he could also not sign. So in order to tell his name, he once dipped three fingers in ink and then impressed them on a page. As a result, three lines are virtually unchanged and remained in all Sultan Togras to come. All of their Togras included the three lines as well as two ovular loops on the side and the Sultan's name, his father's name, and the phrase, eternally victorious. While all Togras had those features, they were all changed and unique to each Sultan. All Sultans as well as Princes would have their own Togra, which court artists created anew with each ruler's succession. Perhaps the best historical examples are not so much the very similar Sultan logos, but the kind of graphic symbol Togras used by by the Ottoman officials on documents, coins, and other objects, as well as to mark buildings. Pastrami is going to be number six because why not? Meat preservation outside of North America's indigenous clans goes back to the Romans and the Huns, but the Ottomans' take on it has become a widespread comfort food. Here's how. The Ottomans advanced meat preservation methods by slow drying quality meat, oftentimes beef, goat, duck, or mutton, with days of smoldering or pressure, then further preserving it with herbs, spices, and of course, salt. There are even records of making pastrami by placing the meat in saddlebags where it was pressed against the rider's legs as they rode. So the result was a jerky-like meat, deep in color, strong in flavor. Because of the spices used and the meat's portability, the recipe migrated along the spice route of Eastern Europe before landing in the lap of Romania, where an adapted version of the recipe traveled with Romanian Jews to 
to Lower East Side, New York when fleeing persecution. Jewish Romanians began to make this preserved deli meat with beef as it was the most available. And due to the advent of refrigerators, they were also able to use a weaker salt brine and develop a softer form of cured meat, which was finally named pastrami. The current version in Turkey is made by rubbing beef in salt to cure it, drying it in open air for several days, and covering it with a thick spice rub. Original to its tougher, jerky origins. Forward date bank checks are number five, because its continuation has caused modern day Turkey to have a relative immunity to the global banking crisis. This practice actually came to be due to the Quran chapter 2 verse 282. The verse is quite long, otherwise I would quote it directly, but instead I will summarize that all debts must be kept in writing, on paper, under the written guarantee of two witnesses and with an expiry date, rendering every citizen to a bank and creating paper money when these debt papers were transferred. To ensure the fairness of any documentation, it's one of the only times where two women could actually substitute for one man as a witness. This is to guard against the possibility that one witness may marry the other. But this practice is actually banned in the West. While there's a lot of debate as to why, the main opinion is that it was simply the Westerners being mad or confused about how something worked in a region that wasn't theirs and banning it in their own. Like how the Vikings being clean was slanderous to Brits. No matter what, the Turkey banking infrastructure saw pure benefit from this forward dating. Number four is medical tools. The Ottomans contributed hugely to modern medicine and the understanding of conditions, something we'll talk about a little later in the countdown as well. Ottoman surgeons, yes, they were doing surgeries way back then, they were first using bamboo shoots, shells, and even their cleaned fingers as their surgical equipment. They learned how to stimulate bladders externally to help surgical patients relieve themselves as well, like a human catheter. For these reasons, the Ottomans, with their stash of precious metals, went to work inventing forceps, scalpels, pincers, lancets, and the catheter itself. All of the modern versions of these listed surgical items are direct recreations of the Ottoman empires, advanced to be suitable in our modern times. Also usually thrown away after one use. <laughs> Additionally, I'd be remiss not to mention how they inspired modern medicine by establishing the first hospital and health centers. But wait, there's more. The healthcare was then divided based off of patient sex and treated them completely separately, even training female physicians to try and aid in the comfort of female patients in a male dominated medical field. They also adopted the holistic approach to treatment. They believe that when a person is sick, it affects the total being, including the physical and spiritual aspects. Number three is data protection laws. So similar to the forward date checks, this little thing has made a huge difference in the long run. The Ottoman Empire was extremely complex in terms of its multiple legal systems and hundreds of ethnicities and religions. So they began to document everyone and everything and base records on them, preserved and a Shari Deftered record book. Obviously, this data had to be correctly entered and double checked with whom it was about to ensure its accuracy. Obviously, this employed many people to do, and there was even developed control techniques and cipher shorthands to make the process quick and efficient and detailed. On top of that, if a page was to be ripped, removed, stained, torn, anything that created an inconsistency or damaged records, it was punishable by death. Ottomans developed multi-religious, multi-ethnic governmental system where each community had its own legal, educational, and social services. Nothing like that it was really the same in our modern world. Meanwhile, tucked away under cities, in museums, and in government buildings are millions of books waiting to be decoded, read, translated, and analyzed at the Ottoman archives. Number two, we revisit what I promise, psychiatric care. Revolutionary is a great word for the Ottoman understanding of mental illness and disorders. Nowhere else was this level of understanding really found at the time, which was over 20 plus diagnosable mental illnesses that they named, wrote descriptions for, and learned how to treat. Now obviously they're different from our modern terms, but they're actually very accurate and symptoms were well recorded. Some are incredibly descriptive, capturing conditions we see today such as BPD, depression, insomnia, but also things like sleep apnea, apple epilepsy and dyslexia and so many other more conditions. Even nicotine, alcohol and opium addiction is documented. These classifications are found in the Ottoman medical manuscripts between the 15th and the 18th centuries. A majority of neurological illnesses are mentioned under the title of diseases of the head and this is because illnesses caused by a central peripheral nervous system were, well, 
physically in your head, so they felt it counted with mental illness. So knowing what they did, the Ottomans catered to it. They built separate health facilities for people with traumas and mental illnesses where they were cared for and looked after until their release or until they passed. These properties had gardens, recreation activities, books, songs, and lots of access to fresh water and beautiful scenery. All of these items were believed to return a person to themselves so that they may feel whole and healed again. Music also played a factor in healing. In fact, music therapy is number one in our countdown. The Ottomans believe that the cosmos were created by the word k, as ordered by the universe's creator. This means that the beginning of the cosmos was started by a sound. So because of the belief that God was comprehended through a spoken word or sound that were also perceived as a letter, the essence of existence is believed to be a sound. Letters were believed to be the representation of human essence as a result. This correlation played an important part in the belief that music therapy might re-establish the upset harmony of a patient, creating a sane balance between body, mind, and emotions. Patients suffering from certain illness or the emotions of persons with certain temperament were expected to be influenced by specific modes of music. Certain makams, musical notes, were prescribed for therapeutic purposes. Modes put into patterns, songs, were believed to express special meanings. Though there were about 80 Turkish modes, usually only 12 were prescribed in therapy in accordance to the limitation of the related theories of cosmic elements and numerology, as it is in the Islamic and ancient sources. From old texts we can deduce the kind of music which was supposed to cure a certain kind of disease or create certain feelings and favor certain behaviors, though musical modes of those days are not the same as the ones we know today. 10 will be all about how one magic stone has a whole lot of uses. It's the Viking Sunstone. This stone was said to accurately pinpoint the position of the sun even through a cloudy, stormy, or twilight sky. To quote an explanation, when you're looking through the sunstone you are not looking for colors but for shadows. If you draw a dot on the top of the crystal and look through it from the bottom, then two dots will appear. If you hold the crystal up to the sky and rotate the crystal until the two dots have the exact same intensity or darkness, at that angle, the upward facing surface indicates the direction of the sun. The oldest sunstone that could have been used for navigation was found amongst a wreckage of a warship called the Alderney, which sank between England and France in 1592. Archaeologists made the assumption that this crystal was used for navigation because it was found about a meter away from another navigation tool. So in other words, Words, speculations because it could have been a paperweight for all we know. But it was in the Raouf's Pater, which is written in the 12th century, that's used to support the navigation theory. A story from King Olaf Haraldsson II, set in 1030 CE, tells how he was visited by a rich and wise farmer. Said farmer tells the king he mastered the skill where he can tell the time of day and night even when the sky is hidden by clouds without a sunstone. And so, to quote, the king made the people look out and they could nowhere see a clear sky. He then asked Sigurar, the farmer, to tell where the sun was at that time. He gave clear assertion. Then the king made them fetch a solar stone and held it up and saw where the light radiated from the stone and thus directly verified Sigurar's prediction. Guess two things were proven true in that text. A farmer has magic powers and Vikings use sunstones. And while I'm still on the Vikings, may as well bring up number nine, another inexplicable invention of theirs, the Uberfelt swords. Ah, Scandinavian words. I feel like my tongue is just gonna jump out of my mouth and run away trying to say them sometimes. You ever been to Ikea and just read that stuff? Anyways, what makes these swords so inexplicable? We aren't sure how they're made. Listen to this. We'll be learning about Damascus steel in the next point, but it's believed the scans may have borrowed this technique or even materials from the Damascus steel process in order to make their legendary swords. To quote, archaeologists were shocked when finding these Viking blades because the technology needed to produce such pure metal wouldn't be invented for another 800 years. What reaffirms our archaeologists belief that the steel pattern was not just mimicked but actually shared between the scans in the Middle East was a 9th century Viking grave that was found and excavated in 2014. Inscribed on the warrior's sword was 4 slash 2 Allah written in Islam. This could be a massive link between the two worlds that confirms the sharing of knowledge or at least a steel for steel trade. And as stated Damascus steel is next on our countdown coming in at number 8. Some of y'all may have heard of this one by now especially if you're a regular viewer on our channel. If so, lots of love, and if not, join the fam by subscribing to The Hive. But anyways, what is Damascus steel? Well, it's a very special type of metal that was being produced out of raw material, wood steel, which was harvested in Asia. It was first used around 300 BCE, but the knowledge seems to have been inexplicably lost around the mid-18th century. The secret of making the Middle East Damascus steel has only re-emerged under modern-day skills.
scanning of electron microscopes. Turns out nanotechnology was heavily involved in Damascus steel production as the materials were added to the steel's production to create chemical reactions at a quantum level, as explained by the archaeology expert K. Chris Hurst. Alongside Peter Pulfer, it stated that the metal developed a microstructure called carbide nanotubes, extremely hard tubes of carbon that are expressed on the surface and create the blade's hardness, Hurst explained. Materials added during the production of Damascus steel include cassia bark, milkweed, vanadium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and some rare element traces which are presumably coming from mines in India. This may be why the Damascus steel recipe was lost, however, as Hurst wrote, what happened in the mid 18th century was that the chemical makeup of the raw material altered and the minute quantities of one or more minerals disappeared, perhaps because a particular load was exhausted somewhere in the world. Next up is a bit of an oddball, it's the Oxford Bell Batteries, number 7. And unlike most entries on this list, scientists could probably figure out how the Oxford Bell Batteries worked literally tomorrow if they tried. But why aren't they? Well, see, in order to do that experiment, they'd need to end another experiment, which is somehow inexplicably kept going for, hmm, yet yeah, over 180 plus years on accident? On accident. See, this bell has been ringing since 1840 when it was built by the London firm Watkins and Hill. They created two dry pile batteries to power the bell swing. Two batteries that should have died within weeks. Yet somehow these primitive batteries are still going, leading experts to realize their internal composition must be unique to have kept going on so strongly. Though scientists are desperate to figure out said composition, the bell is one of the oldest ongoing experiments in the world, and to see what made it continue for so long means ending it prematurely. Surely, which is just too great of a cost. So I guess we're waiting for the battery to die, if it ever does. We've hit the mid video point, so I'm gonna talk about two points to you that the everyday person has definitely heard of. But what they haven't heard of is their history. So let's start with number six, the enema. That's right, as talked about in the recent video, top 10 dark secrets of the Maya civilization, enemas are quite literally as old as time itself. What is an enema? For my sweet summer children that have somehow not been exposed to the literal down under of the medical world, World, an enema is a fluid injection in the back door for the purposes of clearing a bowel. However, cultures in pre-Columbian times and quite a few others did use it for ingesting substances to get a quicker effect. The earliest medical text in existence, Egyptian Ebers Papyrus of 1550 BCE, mentions the enema, which they believed was invented by the god Thoth. The Olmecs, who predated even the Mayans, used enemas for rituals as well as for disease, as did the Mayans as documented during the colonial period, e.g. in the Florentine Codex. Heck, in Parisian society, they were doing enemas as many as three a day. Louis XIV was said to have taken over 2,000 in his lifetime. Enemas were known in ancient Samaria, Babylonia, India, Greece, and China. The indigenous of North America, even though far removed, independently discovered them as well. In fact, there's hardly a region in the world where people did not discover or adopt the enema. And as a result, we can't actually say who invented it first and who shared the information with who. It seems as a whole society collectively agreed we should put some some stuff back there and see what comes out. The second one you've heard of, and I'd be worried if you didn't, is feminine hygiene, number five. People of the world had to find a solution for that once a month nightmare, and historically the creation of menstruation products has been dependent on geographical location, cultural attitudes towards menstruation, and available materials. Some examples are in the 5th century BC, a Greek physician and father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, wrote that in Greece they used wool wrapped around wooden splints as tampons. As documented in the 10th century, however, they also fashioned wool into rags that they would simply fold and tuck. This information comes to us from the lovely story of a woman who is said to have thrown one of her used menstrual rags at an admirer in an attempt to get him to leave her alone. Ancient Egyptians are thought to have used papyrus fibers in a similar fashion to the Greek tampon. Their strategy was more like rolling a very tight scroll that would act as a cork, as papyrus isn't absorbent. Ancient Japan also used paper in a similar fashion. Some indigenous populations used grass mats, which women would sit upon in law is meant for those who were menstruating. The naturally absorbent grass would just soak everything up. Another popular indigenous style in North America was buffalo skin or moss. And last but not least, in ancient Chinese culture, sand or dried grass was tightly packed and then wrapped in fabric before being used as a pad-like device for protection. Although ovular versions of this were made to be inserted in a tampon-like fashion. All in all, just like our last point, multiple cultures conjured up their own solutions for menstruation. And many of them were decomposable. It's not possible to know who made 
him first as a result, but it's quite obvious everyone had their own answers. Next up is an invention that Mythbusters couldn't even figure out. It's the heat ray number four. Greek mathematician Archimedes is one day sat down and dreamed big. And what he developed with that from that was the heat ray weapon that defied, as mentioned, even the skills of Discovery Channel's Mythbusters to replicate in 2004. This weapon is quite simple. To quote, it's quite literally a ranks of polished bronze shields reflecting the sun rays at enemy ships. The ships were moored within the bow and arrow range, and according to legend, the Roman ships burned by the collective condensed sunlight shining from these mirrors. Ship after ship in the Roman fleet caught fire and sank into the Mediterranean. Although Mythbusters failed to reproduce this ancient weapon and declared it a myth, MIT students succeeded one year after the MV experiment in 2005. They actually managed to combust a boat in San Francisco Harbor. Sadly, the heat ray, if it did exist in the olden times, did not save Archimedes. The Roman soldiers eventually breached Syracuse's walls and despite orders from Claudius Marcellus that Archimedes not be harmed, one of the invaders killed him during the sack of the city. And the Sissimioscope is next up for number three, and it's the first earthquake detecting tool in history. Yet you wouldn't guess it by looking at this ornate, golden, dragon festooned, toad surrounded vessel from around 132 AD. The basic premise was as follows. When the earth, well, quakes, one of the dragons, each representing principal directions of the compass, would spit out a bronze ball into the toad's mouth, indicating the direction of the quake. The instrument was said to have detected a 400 mile distance earthquake, which was not felt at the location of the device. But to this day, no one actually knows what's inside the artifact or how it works. If we want to find out, we'd have to quite literally break the thing, similar to the Oxford Bells. Some say it could have been a simple pendulum based system, but the exact science remains a mystery. Number two is the iconic Roman concrete. Why is it iconic? Stamina, baby. You can't even breathe near modern day pieces of cement without blowing a damn pothole in the thing. Yet the Colosseum still stands after what's essentially in my tiny brain a bajillion years. Why is that? Ash. Not as in it was like ashy, slap some lotion on it, but like actual volcanic ash. Researchers have worked in recent years to uncover the secret of this ancient concrete's longevity, and the secret was in front of their faces the whole time. An article published in 2013 by the University of California Berkeley News Center announced that the university researchers described for the first time how the extraordinary stable compound calcium aluminum cicate hydrate, abbreviated to just cash, binds the material. The process of making it would create a lower carbon dioxide emission than the process of making modern concrete. Some disadvantages of its use, however, is that it takes longer to dry, and although it lasts longer, it is weaker. Did the Romans add ash intentionally, recognizing, even without all the big sciencey words for it, that it added to the longevity? That's the next thing for scientists to crack. And now, last but never least, is number one, the flexible glass. Yeah, that's right, glass, but make it flexible. However, there are only three ancient accounts of the substance known as Vertrum Flexile, and they don't make it exactly clear enough to determine if the substance really existed. The story of its invention was first told by Petronius in 63 AD. He wrote about a glassmaker who presented the Emperor Tiberius, who reigned from 14 to 37 AD, with a glass vessel. He asked the Emperor to hand it back to him. At which point the glassmaker, to the shock of the king's court, threw it at the floor. Everyone expected to hear a shatter, but it didn't break. The strange glass only dented, which the glassmaker hammered back into shape quickly. So what did the emperor do to award this amazing god sent invention? Completely panic, apparently. Fearing the devaluation of precious metals, Tiberius literally ordered the inventor be beheaded, so the secret died with him. Pliny the Elder of 79 AD told this story as well, but he also said that although the story was frequently told, it may not be entirely true. The version told a couple hundred years later by Dio Cassius morphed the glassmaker into some sort of magician. And when the vessel was thrown at the floor, it did break, but the glassmaker just magicked it back together. In 2012, the glass manufacturing company Corning introduced its flexible willow glass. Heat resistant and flexible enough to be rolled up, it's proven especially useful in making solar panels. But if that unfortunate Roman glassmaker did indeed invent Vitron Flexel, then he was thousands and thousands of years ahead of his time. 